Target Jobs Law National Pupillage Fair and to the Talks Programme. Um, this is the BPPC and Funding Talk. Uh, I'd like to introduce your panel to you. We've got uh, Professor Stuart Syme uh, from the City Law School, uh, Ishan Kolhatkar from BPP Law School, uh, Jane Irvin from the University of Law, uh, and Mason Bloom from Silver Levine Accountants. Okay, uh, welcome to Talk Program. I'm going to hand you over to your speakers because we're quite tight on time. So if we could start with the City Law School. Okay. Hello, I'm Professor Stuart Simon. I'm the uh, Programme Director on the uh, Bar Professional Training Course at, at City Law School. Uh, I've got a little um, PowerPoint for the talk, and uh, there should be a printout of that. Uh, has everyone at the back got a copy of that? Right, fantastic. Uh, my, my, my brief is basically to talk about the application system and also about associations and societies which may be useful to get involved in. So I'm going to start off with um, our, 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 the applications. Now, we have an online system called the Bar Student Application System, Bar SAS for the militaristic uh, uh, among us. And on the uh, fourth slide, you can see that there's a website and uh, there's also a reference there to a very short five-page user guide for applying, um, which I've got a copy, copy of, which is a very useful document. If you look at the fifth slide, you can see that basically all BPTC applicants must apply online. There's no sort of under-the-counter applications direct to, to, to providers. You're asked to select six programmes in order of preference, so your number one choice uh, going down to number six. Uh, many providers have part-time programmes as well as full-time ones, and each of those counts as a separate programme for this particular pro process. And your first three will be considered on the first round by BPTC providers, so it's very important to get them in the right order. Um, the lower preferences that you have will only be considered, if at all, um, in clearing after the main offers have been looked at by, by applicants. Now, uh, you can see that offers are made in March, and... Um, there is a second round if you've missed the boat because the uh, closing date for the first round was in early January and uh, you, you, you can come in again um, after, after that happens. Now, on the application form itself, there, I had a look at one this morning. It's about 11 pages long. Um, most of it is um, biometric information and your academic record, which should be relatively easy to fill in. But they've got five or six difficult questions and on the one I looked at, it was around about two pages of the completed form on, on these, and they are asking for things like your experience on mini pupillages. Uh, what do you, why do you want to train to be a barrister, which is a fairly typical pupillage question as well. Examples of public speaking and mooting, work experience, and any other relevant supporting evidence. Now, what I'd say about the application form is make sure that you fill it in in the same way as you would any other important form, with um, some care, and also. Answer it truthfully. There are no golden bullet answers that are the ideal answer for any of those particular questions. Uh, answer them from your own experience is the, is the best advice. You also need to provide two referees. The advice is to go for two academic referees, not one of each, although you can have one of each if you like. Um, a great deal of weight is actually placed on those references for a variety of purposes. And um, but basically your referees should be providing a re reference um, Actually, they should have done it already, right, to, be, to be quite honest. Um, if, if you're having a problem, you can actually substitute a referee, um, uh, and the guide tells you how to do that. And over the page, um, you'll see that BPTC offers are basically uh, going to go out imminently. Um, that's next week. Uh, you may be given a conditional offer, maybe on getting a particular grade or a provision of a English language certificate, for example. Uh, they also have expiry dates, and you've got to comply with that, because basically once it expires, then uh, your place may go to someone else. Um, if you're having a bit of a difficulty, you can ask for an extension. And I would point this out. We're all, con we're all lawyers, aren't we? Offer plus your acceptance equals contract. And uh, uh, once you've accepted, basically you're taken off the system, and you can't then go and um, um, uh, agree to another one. The next slide is talking about English language and the aptitude test, both of which are requirements for all people going on to the BPTC. Um, basically, English language is English language proficiency, so um, you, you should have a good standard. It's about 7.5 on the IELTS test as a minimum. If you've got any doubts on that, the advice is take the test and check it out. Basically, people who are locals should be well above that already, but um, if you've got an issue about it, make sure that um, you take the test. And the aptitude test needs to be done as well. Uh, it's, it's a bit like doing the um, theory test for, the, for driving. We're going to do it at the test centre. It takes about 40 minutes. And it's basically on critical reasoning and thinking. 
Uh, there are some examples on the BSB website, which it would be a good idea to have a look at um, before we take the test. The next two slides basically have the timetable with dates uh, for various things to do with uh, jo joining the INS and uh, pupillage and so on as well as the app application, and then some websites uh, where, where you can get further information. Anyway, that's the first half of my brief. second half of the brief is to talk a little bit about associations and societies. Now, I've brought along an exhibit. This is my practicing certificate. It's my current practicing certificate. I'm everyone at the bar gets one of these. And when I look at it, it says um, that I'm authorised to exercise rights of audience before every court in relation to all proceedings. And there's three other bullet points as well. Um, when you apply for pupillage, that is essentially what chambers are thinking about. We are recruiting for someone who is able to be an advocate in all courts in all, for all types of proceedings. Um, so we want someone who's going to fit the criteria for being a successful advocate. Otherwise, what's the point of taking someone on? And if you look at my last bullet point on the second um, page, you'll see, see what our chamber's looking for. And I've got, got a number of points down there, which are sort of developing that idea a little bit. Um, so they're looking for, on the second bullet point, a necessary skill set of advocacy and written skills, but also other things like commercial awareness and can you deal with people and, uh, and so on. They're also looking, if you look at the, the penultimate point there, a genuine interest in the bar and probably their sort of chambers, and if possible, their chambers in particular would be ideal. Now, what is the point about talking about societies and associations? Well, essentially, it is so that you, when you're applying for chambers, can actually evidence, demonstrate with something a little bit more tangible that you have those attributes that chambers are really <coughs> looking for. And so you're looking at TV enhancing activities, and I've got a list of those. I think you'll be, be familiar with most of those already since you're all se uh, serious students. Um, and when you look at the third slide on, on, on the third page, you can see that basically there should be some societies where you are at the moment at university or on your BPTC course when you go do that um, ne next year, and you should be involved in those because they will help you with, with those sorts of things. Um, not only taking part with maybe mooting itself, but also committee membership is quite useful, and it gives you a number of soft skills which most lawyers don't really have, but only a small number do. Um, so, so leadership and uh, financial acumen, if you're a treasurer, for example, those sorts of things are actually quite useful um, in, in the real world. And then make a point about taking part and winning. That's great to do a bit of debating, great to do um, a mini or two. It's even better to win. Um, and there's a big difference between the two. And what I tend to say to, to, to people is, well, if you are, if you've already taken part and you're unlikely to win next time you, you, you do this, do something different and see if you can excel in that, add a line to your CV. Um, the most obvious society is actually the inn. Um, you can join an inn, usually from the second year of undergraduate um, courses on, on law. There's one off at the moment, uh, £105 fee. That's very good value for money. They have a whole range of societies and clubs, some of them um, uh, rather more social, like um, music and yachting and golfing and that sort of thing, some rather more um, law-related, like the Denning Society at um, Lincoln's Inn, um, it's mooting, advocacy training and so on, all offered by the Inn. It's a really good um, place to, 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 to go. And one of the great things about the Inns as well is that those activities are often not only student-based but also have practitioners along as well. It's a great opportunity to, to actually meet members of the Inn at a more senior level and uh, there can be entries to things like mini pupillages, marshalling and things like that. The inns are a great resource and well worth having uh, get, getting involved in. My last slide about outside clubs, I'd say the same sort of thing applies. They can be good, they can be a complete waste of time. They could be a great way of un unwinding. Um, if, you're, if you're, say, a runner and you've represented the county, that is obviously worth putting on your application, isn't it? Um, doing some recreational swimming, on the other hand, probably everybody does that. You're not going to put that on your application forms. So I think on outside clubs, I'd say the same sort of thing. If you're thinking about being serious about the bar, think about this. This is what the bar, the bar is looking for. Is what I'm doing something which is actually going to help me on that? And if so, obviously, it's a good thing to do. Are we on, on time? Yeah. Fantastic. Now I'm going to pass over <laughs> to, to Isha. Thanks very much. Thank you. Uh, my name is Ishan Kolhatka. I'm a tutor at BPP Law School. 
I was at the criminal bar for about nine years before I went to BPP in September in 2011 to teach. I've been asked to talk to you uh, this morning about the course itself and pro bono opportunities. And I thought, well, I have two choices. I could spend eight minutes reading you the BPTC syllabus. Yep, that's the kind of reaction I thought I'd probably get. Or I could perhaps talk to you about why you want to become a barrister and show you how that links into the course. Now, everyone in this room at some point has been part of the bar bidding war. Look at me blankly, let me explain. At some point you've been in a room and someone has said to you, well, I've wanted to be a barrister since my second year at university. And somebody else says, no, I've, been, I've wanted to be a barrister since I was 18, and then 16, and then 17, then 14, 12, 11, 8. 8. I've wanted to be a barrister since I was 8. I have an 8-year-old son. I can promise you that the last thing he wants to do is be a barrister. At the moment it's um, a spaceman, a train driver, and Lego designer, all part-time can join into one. <laughs> So let's think realistically. Why do we want to be a barrister? That's more important than when the idea first germinated in your mind. What does a barrister do? What do you ultimately spend your day doing? If I asked you to conjure up an image in your mind, I suspect it would differ. Some of you would think about sitting in chambers and drafting documents. I suspect many of you think of a bewigged person in court fighting their corner, fighting their client's corner. Well, it's a combination of the two, isn't it? It's a combination of written work, it's a combination of advocacy, it's a combination of the research uh, that goes into your particular case, and having that background knowledge that allows you to do all of this with ease. And what are we ultimately trying to do at the bar? You're ultimately trying to persuade a court, or the other side, or both perhaps, that you are right. So does that mean that talking ten to the dozen, enjoying talking is the reason to come to the bar? Certainly it's something I thought about. It will come as no surprise, having heard me for about two minutes, that I quite like the sound of my own voice. And when I was growing up, I thought, I want a job where I get to talk a lot. And I thought, well, I could become... Uh, I could go into marketing, maybe. I could do that. I could stand on a street corner and shout a lot. Probably doesn't pay the bills. Or I could go to the bar. And when I thought about going to the bar and went and did some mini pupillages, I learned that it wasn't just about talking. It was also about listening. And the two skills are so interlinked. And we sometimes forget when we're talking that we need to listen as well. And where does that bring us to? Well, the bar, if it's about persuasion, if it's about all of these different facets, it is about being trained in order to do these effectively before you go off and do pupillage. And that's what the BPTC does for you. So let's take a moment then to examine the content of the course. A large part of the course, 25% of it, is uh, three subjects that are centrally set by the Bar Standards Board. Civil litigation, criminal litigation, and professional ethics. And they are three subjects where you will have to learn a huge amount of information over the course of a year and be able to take an exam in which you do multiple choice questions and short answer questions and pass both sections of the course. Now, on the one hand, you may think to yourself, well, in practice, I'll have a book. I can look this up. Yeah, that's true. In the exam, you won't. But you do need that base level of knowledge. You need to know how things work, the order in which things come. And these big books, the White Book, Archbold, Blackstone's Criminal Practice, many of the others that are out there, are useful if you know how to use them. So, part of the year on the BPTC is learning how to use these books, learning how to apply the knowledge within them from others to the problem that you have, and solving a problem. Professional ethics is tuition in the ethics of the bar. Some of it will come to you very naturally. Some of it will seem unnatural and an artificial construct. But learning how that works helps you think like a lawyer, and in particular, think like a barrister. The bit that I hope you're all looking forward to when you take the BPTC is advocacy. There are three advocacy assessments on the BPTC. There's one that is making submissions to a judge, not necessarily my cup of tea when compared to the other two, which are witness handling where you get to examine in chief, good fun, and cross-examine. There is nothing like seeing students cross-examining one another. You see some of the passive aggressiveness in their year come out when they get to do this, but you also get to see people developing their skills and learning how to be effective advocates. And all three of those are assessed, as you'd assume, as an advocacy assessment, with submissions assessed by way of you making submissions to a judge, and with the other two, with you cross-examining or examining in chief a witness played by an actor. 
But the bar's not all about talking, sadly for me. There's also some writing to do, and so there's two written assessments, and those are opinion writing and drafting. And those are two assessments where you write an opinion or you draft a particulars of claim or a defence. And those are documents that contain sort of particular legal formalities to them, which you'll learn on the course, but also you need to be able to develop your written style. Now, here's something of a leap from undergraduate study to the BPTC. Instead of writing something and coming up with a few ideas and saying at the end, well, here we are, these are the ideas I came up with, take them away, let them wash over you um, and wonder about them. With uh, opinion writing and drafting, with writing like a lawyer, you've got to come to an opinion. You've got to show some judgment. And so that's something you do at the bar. That's something we want to see on the BPTC. What else do we have? Redoc, resolution of disputes outside of court. The world's increasingly moving to one where people are trying not to go to court and spend their time resolving matters before they ever get there. Well, often they still need lawyers to do that. So you learn the skills of um, the various ways in which disputes can be resolved without needing to recourse to a court. And then finally, in terms of the compulsory subjects, conference. You learn how to have a conference with a client. Now, this is one where you think, well, yeah, I'm sociable. I know how to talk to people. This seems quite easy. Yes, perhaps. But just imagine that you're going to have to give someone some quite difficult advice or tell them that they are, having been convicted, going to go to prison now. That takes a very different mindset. And so we on the course make sure that you are able to effectively impart information and listen to what your client is saying. And then finally, at the end of the course, you get to do two options, and the various providers run different options and different numbers of options, and these are in specialised areas of practice. And they can be uh, as general as things like judicial review, or as particular as things like, for example, I run a module on professional discipline, which looks at how professionals face disciplinary proceedings within their professional body. So 12 modules that get you to think like a lawyer, be practical, and persuade which is, after all, what you are going to spend the rest of your life doing. I don't think that the BPTC is necessarily the most academically challenging course that there is out there. But what it certainly is, is one where you work extremely hard. Whilst you may only have five or six classes in a week, in order to be effective at the course, you need to spend 40 hours a week on it. How you choose to arrange those hours is very much a matter for you. But it's a skills-based course. So there is no way of just thinking, well, I'll read a book and I'll turn up at the assessment and I'll be fine. You've got to practice those skills again and again. You've got to get comfortable with the idea of being recorded and watching yourself back. I've been told that my time is up, so I'm going to spend 20 seconds talking about the last thing I'm supposed to talk about. <laughs> Pro bono. It's really good. It really is good. It's not a waste of time in any way, shape or form. It's a chance to go and do some work help others and find out what you're good at and put something on your CV so that when Stuart or I or someone else reads your application form or chambers, they can see your commitment to the bar. Thank you very much. Hi everyone, I'm Jane. Um, I did the bar course last year, so I finished in 2014. I got called in July. Um, I studied at the University of Law and I also did the GDL there as well. So my talk's slightly different in it, that it's my experiences as a student. And I want to talk about some of the things that I found helpful, which I wish I'd known when I was in your position. And I don't want to repeat too much what's already been said about structure, and I just want to highlight a couple of things. So the BPTC, as has already been mentioned, is, is very different to, to study that you've done either at university or on the GDL. It's a lot more practical, it's a lot more get on your feet and become more involved in the classroom. So there's an awful lot of advocacy but the way the classes are structured is, at least at the University of Law, is to mirror what a barrister's life's like, so mirror the litigation process from start to finish. So, for example, on the criminal module, you begin with what happens at the police station, you finish with appeals and sentencing, and along the way they weave in ethics, they weave in advocacy, so bail applications, witness handling, which has implied is a lot of fun because you can be difficult to your fellow students. So... It, it's a very different method of studying and I think not everybody realises that on the first day of the course that they get thrown in the deep end and it it would be nice to know in advance that y you need to learn how to you know just to adapt your way of study to a more practical course. Advocacy is obviously one of the most important parts. Um, I know in my class there are a lot of people who are quite 
nervous about getting up and talking in front of their classmates pretty much from day one. The first thing we were asked to do was stand up and say 10 interesting facts about yourself, which I think everybody dreads anyway. But doing it when there's a lot of confident people in the room. But by the end of the year, because you do, I think there's something like 32 advocacy sessions, you completely, you know, it's natural, you just stand up and, and talk. Um, what I would say is obviously there's very strict attendance requirements on the course and the practitioner events, um, although they don't, a lot of students think, oh, they don't count towards attendance, so why bother going? I would say that's probably one of the best, best things that we did on the course. So practitioners come in and watch you do a bail application or a civil piece of advocacy and then afterwards they give you feedback and then they give you a glass of wine at the end of the evening so you get to chat through your performance in a more informal setting. So I would definitely recommend getting involved in all that sort of thing. But outside of the classroom, there's also a lot of advocacy opportunities that aren't compulsory, but they all, A, add to your confidence, your advocacy skills, but they also are something you can put on your pupillage applications. Um, one of the things that was probably the highlight in my year was the mock trials. So these are opportunities for you to get involved in real courtrooms and in front of real judges. We have a jury which was made up of GDL and LLB students which reached a verdict at the end of the day. And the witnesses from memory were trainee met police officers. So it was a chance for them to get involved and see what the courtroom process was like. So it's all very well doing it in a classroom where it, it's quite <laughs> where it's quite relaxed. Um, there is courtroom furniture in all the BPTC classrooms, so there's a, there's a witness stand, a witness box, etc. But when you're in the forbidding um, Blackfriars Crown Court, obviously it's a very old, very traditional building, everything that you think you've learned completely goes out of the window and it's quite an intimidating setting. So to be able to do it during the BPTC year rather than when you get on your feet in pupillage is fantastic. So yes, it's on a Saturday and Sunday, but it's brilliant. Um, there's also the equivalent for the civil mock trial. Again, I think this year it's being held in Wilson Crown, uh, Wilson's County Court. Sorry, um, same proceedings. You start from the beginning. You do all of the applications. You question witnesses, and again, it brings the whole thing to life. And they also arrange it so it falls quite nicely before your advocacy exams. So what you've learnt can be put into practice for the exams. Um, as has already been mentioned, there's also a number of competitions. There's mooting negotiation, plea mitigation. They're not compulsory, obviously. You obviously have a heavy workload, so a lot of people think, why should I add to my workload? I'd recommend doing it. Um, some people in interviews I had, they brought them up. I didn't think they would because I thought everybody does mooting, but they were quite in-depth about um, what I did at the mooting competitions. So my advice would be getting involved in as much as you can, even if you think it's something that's out of your comfort zone. Um, it builds your confidence and it again is something to put on the application. The other thing I would say is other opportunities at all the providers for pro bono, which again has been mentioned briefly. Um, it's not all necessarily advocacy, but again it's all experience getting with clients, um, getting real, giving law to, legal advice to real members of the public. Um, I was a runner at one of the county courts where you help the clerk see if anybody who's turned up needs um, legal advice from a solicitor. Just because you want to go to the bar, from my experience, in interviews they also asked about other work experience that you've done, so it might be training um, back schemes, it might be um, through work, it might be things at your local legal advice centre, it's, it's all relevant. Um, so I know the University of Law works at the National um, Centre for Domestic Violence, there's a lot of schemes for litigants in person, so people who represent themselves at the Royal Courts of Justice, they can offer support to them. So it's all different things for the CV and for pupillage applications. Um, there's also the employability service itself, and I know a lot of people of my friends on the course of it got towards pupillage application time, and it comes around incredibly quickly. And they wish they got involved with the career service earlier. They as mock pupillage interviews, as CV drop-ins, a lot of panel discussions, so members of chambers come along, have question and answer sessions. So again, yes, it might be in the evening on a Friday, but at the end of the year, when it gets this time of year, you, you're glad you did it. Um, the other thing I've mentioned very, very briefly, because I know it's going to be mentioned, is funding. Obviously, the course is a lot of money. Um, one of the tips that I would give is make sure you research all of the different options out there for getting um, funding, scholarships, etc. 
for example, I know a lot of my friends didn't know that the university offers scholarships. The in deadlines come around very quickly. Um, so there's lots of different things out there that can be help you pay the fees. Um, just to finish off with, there's three tips that I would give to anybody starting the BPTC. First one is bring a cabin-sized suitcase on the first day with wheels because the books are incredibly heavy. I saw somebody's mulberry handbag snap when they tried to put the white book inside. Um, again, rather than bringing heavy books to the session, bring a tablet. They're all loaded on there through the library. Don't lug them in every day. And start consolidating your notes early. I'm sick of the word consolidating from the bar course. The tutors say it all the time. But when it gets this time of year and you've got you know 50 topics to learn, you'll wish you'd done it as you went along. So yeah, that, that's what I've got to say. Thank you. Thank you, thank you Jay. Um, good morning, ladies and gentlemen. My name is Mason Bloom. I'm a partner at Silver Levine Chartered Certified Accountants based just up the road in Warren Street. I jointly head up the Specialist Barristers Unit at the practice. We um, currently act for over 1,500 members of the bar from junior barristers to QCs and we are also an award-winning practice as well. I'm going to touch on two topics this morning. One is to do with financing your career at the bar, which I'm sure is a um, quite a, an important issue for many of you sitting here, how, how you're actually going to do that. And the other point is just to give you a few tax tips, so hopefully when you do start as barristers um, we can save you some money straight away. In terms of financing your career at the bar, um, as James mentioned, the fees for the BPTC courses are, um, I would perceive as, as a lot of money, between 12 and uh, 12,000 and 17,000 pounds and on top of that you've got your living expenses as well. There are a combination of funding sources available that could be um, the various um, scholarships, bursaries that are available for the four ends of court. Some of you may have savings and um, some of you may be fortunate enough that your, your parents can assist with um, paying for some of, some of the costs. Um, and there are commercial loans available from banks to assist with the costs. Currently, the, the scholarships that are, that are available from the four inns total just over £5 million this year. You all also, if you are lucky enough to obtain a pupillage um, prior to starting your BPTC course, then you can actually um, um, apply for, uh, some chambers will gi give you a drawdown of your pupillage award, so you'll actually be able to take some of that pupillage award prior to starting pupillage in the BPTC year, so that's definitely something worth um, discussing with chambers when you're, you're looking at applying to them. When you do apply for a scholarship um, from one of the inns, you can only apply um, to one in. You can only put in one application. So you're going to need to pick the right the right in and focus on the in that gives you the the best chances of success. So you'll need to do your homework. Um, what they're looking for, they're looking for um, intellectual ability, that you've, um, excellence at your performance in university, that you can prove your legal research skills, that there's motivation and evidence of serious commitment to succeed at the bar your potential as an advocate, oral skills um, as demonstrated in mooting, debating, mock trials, your personal qualities, personality, integrity um, and also your financial circumstances and need. Lincoln's Inn um, currently this year is offering just over 1.5 million um, concentrated in scholarships and bursaries for the CP and BPTC years. All of these um, scholarships are based on merit. For the BPTC year, they're offering 90 scholarships between 6,000 and 18,500 um, for each scholarship. And the individual awards um, are unlikely to cover the full cost of the fees for the actual course and your living expenses. Some scholarships will include um, um, funding for um, staying at the at the inns, staying at the inn as well, and um, if you need accommodation, and then there are smaller bursaries available. For example, Lincoln's Inn have twenty bursaries, um, up to three thousand pounds each, and there are other smaller awards available. All of this information is 
available um, on the public domain so I would advise you to look at the various websites for the different inns to see um, what funding is available and also um, how to apply for those um, scholarships as well. Inner Temple um, also offers just over one and a half million pounds worth of um, funding to um, for scholarships. And the Middle, middle Temple and Greys offer um, slightly lower funding, um, a million pounds through Middle and Greys offers about 800,000. Other sources of funding for your BPTC year is there are professional and career development loans available. The Learning Skills Council, um, in conjunction with three high street participating banks, Barclays, the Corrupted Bank and RBS, um, will offer loans between £300,000 and £10,000. The Learning Skills Council will pay the interest on that loan while you're studying, um, and then you repay that loan over an agreed period. And there are other um, loans available from high street banks um, for the professional studies loan. It is a um, fiercely competitive market out there. You do need to be realistic about your skills um, and, and your potential at having um, being able to um, make a career at the bar. Just want to also give you a few pointers in terms of um, saving money when you do start at the bar. Um, so you just need to transport yourselves um, through time to hopefully when you're about to start your second six pupillage. The key point we tell all of our clients is you need to put money aside for tax. It doesn't, how, it doesn't matter how successful you are. Um, as, as barristers, we see hundreds of clients each year um, who unfortunately haven't put money aside for their tax and it gives them significant cash flow problems. So that's a key point. You do need to put money aside for tax as you earn it. Pupillage awards, just to... Um, clarify any pupillage award that you receive in your first six is not taxable any pupillage award that you receive in your second six is taxable some chambers do um, weight um, some of more of the pupillage award into the first six so that would be an advantage um, in terms of reducing tax liabilities for VAT if and when you do register for that you can actually go back three years prior to the date of VAT registration and claim back VAT on any assets, capital items purchased for your business. So if you're thinking of buying um, a laptop or a computer or an iPad and, and you're going to be using that in your practice going forward, then I'd definitely keep the receipts for that and you'll be able to claim the VAT back um, on your first VAT return. You also need to be um, aware when you um, first start trading as a barrister, you have um, the ability to choose your first accounting year-end date. Um, one would think that an accounting year-end date should run coterminous with the financial year and so to the 5th of April each year. We actually advise our clients to um, slightly adjust the length of their accounting year-end to the 30th of April each year. What it does, it actually gives a significant cash flow advantage um, throughout the course of your career. So that's something just to be aware of. And what I want to do quickly is just run through all the various business expenses you can claim to offset against your income. The main ones going forward when you do commence as a barrister are chambers costs, however they structure it. Any of your travel expenses, public transport um, costs for travel from your chambers to court, your home to court are all allowable. Any computer running expenses, stationary costs, your indemnity insurance, um, accountancy fees, that's an expense dear to my heart. Um, just to give Silver Levine a quick plug, um, we um, offer a first year free offer, so we'll do your first set of accounts and tax return at no cost. Any subscriptions to any professional associations, bar council, data protection, any research costs, any purchase for any books, magazines, journals, subsistence, which is not your breakfast, lunch or dinner, but it's an occasional snack that you've had to take if you're working on sociable hours. And in my experience, unfortunately, barristers do a lot of work in unsociable hours, so that would be an allowable expense. Any bank charges, bank interest incurred on any accounts you use for business. Any, um, unfortunately, any loans that you take out prior to the commencement of your second six pupillage the interest costs on those loans wouldn't be an allowable business expense 
or any of the training costs that you incur to get you to the point that you can start trading as a barrister. Yes, I'm going to stop you there so we can get a few questions. Yeah, yeah. Um, thank you. <laughs> thank you very much um, for speaking. If anybody's got any questions, we've still got a couple of minutes left if you'd like to ask. Just stick your hand up and shout <laughs> out. Um, five million, the funding that the Inns give at five million a year, realistically, how much is, what's the ratio for like an applicant to the number of possible receivers? Yes, there, 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 I don't think there's a, a statistic on that, but it's highly competitive to get an INS scholarship. Um, so the advice is to put it in on time because the deadline is a real deadline. Uh, and, and secondly, put in a strong application because um, there are plenty of other very worthy people that they will be um, interviewing and so on. Um, very highly competitive. Um, the, the other thing about the, the INS is that there tends to be a, um, a market in it so, so that the INS with the largest pots tend to have more students and the inns with um, smaller amounts of global <coughs> uh, uh, scholarships tend to have fewer students so th there's very little difference actually between them. I just add to what Stuart said, do your research, the, the various inns publish on their website their scholarship criteria, they also publish whether they interview everyone who applies or just some by filtering, so there are I think at last count inner and middle will, have, will um, interview everyone, so if you think I'm probably better in person than I am on paper, that may affect your decision as to where to apply for a scholarship. You can only apply for a scholarship at one in. Um, do you have to have joined an in and like paid the membership before you can apply for their uh, sponsorships? No, you don't. You have to. Um, you can apply for a scholarship, but the the understanding is you apply to one place, and if they give you a scholarship, that you will join them. Okay. Uh, and the deadline for joining the in is the thirty first of May. Um, just if I may ask, um, I know that you've all spoken in, in terms of those students that are hopefully doing the course on a full-time basis. Um, would there be any changes in the advice you've given for those considering doing the course over two years and a part-time course? Yeah, I mean, I, I would certainly say that doing the course part-time, it shouldn't be seen as an easier option. Mm -hmm. It's a very different way of working. Um, the different providers who offer part-time courses structure them differently. Certainly we do them as one weekend a month, and that means you're squeezing in uh, quite a lot of work into one weekend. So you've got to be more disciplined about how you're going to compress your 40 hours or, or elongate them over the course of a month. Um, and also bear in mind that unlike on the full-time course where week by week you're building on something, it's month by month. You've got a lot more um, sort of self-discipline to get through the course. It also, it, it seems like you're spreading the exams out over two years, which is absolutely true, but um, most people on part-time programmes are also combining it with other responsibilities, particularly work responsibilities. Mm -hmm. so, so you tend to need to be very, very disciplined with, with your time to make sure that you are setting aside time every week or every fortnight um, in order to cover what's needed. Okay.